Well, welcome. Thank you for coming to the Ginn Library for be our fourth book talk this year and final, I believe, because we headed into finals. We're going to be recording this, so just be mindful when you're asking questions, if you want to say your name, or don't. It's going to be posted on YouTube with our other book talks. Today we have four uh, professors here with us who um, have worked together on the handbook on forced migration, which is available electronically in the library's collection. It's, I was going to say it's massive. It's 450 some pages. Mm -hmm. um, Karen, Professor Jacobson <laughs> is the editor and a contributor to a chapter or two. And <laughs> you may not touch it. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Saron, Burgess, and Wilson also contributed um, chapters. It is a comprehensive exploration of the challenges and complexities associated with forced migration. The book delves into various themes, including the ambiguous status of migrants, Katrina, the patchwork of international and national laws, and the philosophical underpinnings of forced migration. It examines the historical perspectives, the impact of climate change, I believe, Professor Jacobson wrote about that, and environmental factors and the urbanization of displacement. The handbook also addresses solutions for displaced populations, emphasizing self-reliance, durable solutions, and the importance of ethical standards in research. Throughout a combination of academic analysis, personal narratives, I think Professor Wilson, edited or wrote a chapter on that, and poetry. There's poetry in this book, which I think is super cool. The book offers a holistic view of the lived experiences of refugees and the perspectives of practitioners. It serves as a call to action for a more humane and just approach to addressing the global challenge of forced migration. So over to you all. I don't know how you're Yeah, I'll start. <laughs> That's what we agreed. <clears throat> Thanks so much, everybody, for coming. So I thought what I could start with is talking a little bit about how we, why we put this book together. Um, Alga was very interested in, 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 in having this done, and I was very interested in working with an editor, another person who is a younger scholar, not from the, the North. <clears throat> so I knew this person, Nassim Majidi, who runs actually a research organization in Nairobi and um, called Samuel Hall. And Nassim I'd known for many years and is really a brilliant young scholar, really up and coming scholar and a practitioner because she works, she conduct, they conduct research in Africa and especially Afghanistan a lot. And I just thought she was, she was wonderful and she was and is wonderful co-editor. We worked together absolutely wonderfully together. It was really great. Um, so she and I together <clears throat> started thinking about what kind of book we want. So in the top of, in the field of forced migration, there are lots and lots, not lots, but like maybe a dozen books on, handbooks on forced migration. One in particular, the Oxford, uh, Oxford Press's uh, handbook on forced migration. And also I take this very encyclopedic approach, which is, Forced migration and gender, forced migration and climate change, mm. forced migration and this, forced migration and that, forced migration and that. And we thought that was super done, also boring. So we wanted to do a different approach, which is to, to identify themes we thought were either neglected in the field of, of um, forced migration or super important that weren't going to be faddish, like we weren't going to do fads like securitization or externalization. No, we were going to do things that are, we think, persistent problems that have been around for a long time, are getting worse, are unaddressed, and are very much going to happen in the future. So the three main problems we focused on was <clears throat> what happens with, what is, how is climate change influencing forced migration? And what do we know about it? Some of these topics, okay, we started working on this book, I guess it was published last year, we started working on it like around about all through COVID. Some of these topics are now have raced away from us in terms of new research, scholarship, all of that that's ha happening, including our section on climate change and migration. The second topic we thought was really important 
I did is because it was is the topic of urbanization and urban how how migrants are increasingly coming to passing through returning to cities and so i wanted a, a, to see what we've got on that so urbanization is the second theme and then the third theme was this, so what we're calling solutions now in the in the field of forced migration solutions is usually goes under this uh, bit of jargon called durable solutions. And that is a very long-standing theme in forced migration, which is what happens, how do people, what happens when displacement comes to an end? How do people stop being refugees? And so, and that notion of durable solutions is very old and kind of done with. So our editor on that section, who's really knowledgeable on this, um, really took a different approach to looking at what really are solutions to migration. So the way we put this book together is we, we came up with all these sections and we wanted to, and this was sort of a mistake for those of you who are <laughs> planning to do an edited volume anytime soon. We wanted to identify people who were really good and knowledgeable and then have them be the sub, run the sort of like be the editor on the, the section of the book, right? So we ended up identifying experts in the field <clears throat> and who would then themselves recruit people to do the chapters. Um, some of that really worked out well, some of it really did not work out well. Um, and we also added two new sections that we did not think had been really covered before. One was the section on philosophy of forced migration and how philosophers deal with or don't deal with this issue of forced migration. I mean, some, some philosophers really have, like Hannah Arendt, have in the past dealt with this. I mean, Aristotle did. And, but, so we wanted to look at more contemporary philosophers and how they have tackled this issue. It's very understudied, under-researched area in forced migration. And then the other piece we wanted to bring was how historians, how his, historians and the historiography of, of forced migration, how they have tackled this issue. So on those two sections, I got a very well-known scholar uh, who's herself a historian, Susan Martin, and is very well regarded in the field. And she just knew her way around the history. She, she did beautifully. For the philosophy section, we got someone who's actually a grad student in philosophy, but who's also run Samuel Hall, who's Nassim's husband. <laughs> and um, that was a little bit more of a challenge but we did get some super interesting ideas out of that. Three things we thought were really important. One is how we talk about migration and forced migration. And there we started talking about narratives. And we had we came up with three narratives that we thought were very important. The first was the narrative that the governments use and policymakers. How migration is all about, you know, needing to stop migration, needing to keep contain migration in, in, in sending countries, and therefore we should develop those countries, all good, yes, except it doesn't work, but never mind, mm -hmm. but very much about <laughs> borders and stopping migration and, and how, um, you know, migration is a problem, the, the securitization of migration, that narrative comes from policymakers. So we want, we talk a lot about, a lot about that narrative in the intro. The second narrative we talk about is the humanitarian narrative. That narrative is what humanitarian agencies, aid agencies, <clears throat> like the like UN agencies and NGO, IRC, always talking about migrants, forced migrants, refugees, all of that as being victims. Victims that we, we UN and we NGOs are going to help with your money. So it's very much about pushing a narrative about what refugees need and who they are and pushing this on donors and the public about that you, it's you know help fund us so we can help them and so and to the to the point of egregiousness where you have for example some NGOs that spring to mind which I won't mention who use all kinds of images about women and children either very sad looking or very desperate looking and those are used to get you to take out your checkbook and, and send money to these organizations. Now, of course, it's true that many people are very much in need, but this is a narrative, a, a point of view, a discourse that emerges that really helps shape, uh, shape our understanding of who refugees are, and that is that they're victims, that someone else is going to help. So we really want to make people aware of this narrative. 
And then the third narrative we, talk, we want to talk about is ourselves, what narrative researchers have and how we ourselves are pushing a certain view. And the narrative that we ourselves are pushing as researchers is we are doing independent research, objective research, and we, ours is, is we are really needing to have you know, independence. But of course, many of us researchers, ourselves included, and Asim and I want to be very you know, mindful that we're, it's, we're including ourselves in this. We are funded by the donors and often by the humanitarian agencies too. So how are we trapped in this, in this problem of where we, we have to, so we, what we tackle in the, in the introduction is that what happens when, for example, we take money from, like, for example, we talk about the World Bank. So one of us had a really serious problem in Afghanistan where the World Bank <clears throat> funded a large study, qualitative study that was done by, of in, where they were interviewing many women in Afghanistan. Very long interviews about this topic. <clears throat> and... Um, you know, all kinds of issues around interviewing women in Afghanistan, obviously. This was just before the Taliban took over. And then, it was in uh, 22 that they took over, was it? No, when did, anyway, 22, yeah, August. And um, World Bank decided to sit on that, those data. So we talked a lot, we talked in the interview about how these organiz these institutions, these powerful <coughs> and rich institutions who are funding us, control the data that come out. They decide what's going to be published, what's going to be released, and under what circumstances. And in this case, the bank said, mm, and they just sat on the data for a long time. And then, very bad, they came a year later and they took our data. They said, thanks, we've got it from here. We said, what? They said, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do the analysis. Now, if anybody knows, if you do qualitative research, somebody else cannot do no. your analysis. Mm. It's like the rule number one. If you haven't been interviewing, you have been interviewing those people, you need to analyze those data. So what the bank did is take our data and mixed it with some of data that they had, which is another real problem because those, the, their study had a very different set of research objectives, and so now they're mixing these data together. is a real problem. And, and they you know, then took over the whole thing and released their own report. So it was very bad. And so we're talking in this chapter about some of the problems that researchers in forced migration face when it comes to funding and dealing with these donors and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the, that is what, a, a, like a big theme that we're pushing through the book is understanding the narratives and who's the power, the power relations underpinning what is happening in forced migration research, but also being very aware of institutional narratives that are emerging and shaping our understanding of migration. Anyway, mm -hmm. I've been rabbiting on long enough, so now I'm going to turn it over to um, our, so, so Professor Cerrone and Burgess wrote <clears throat> the first, the second and third chapters, or the second and third chapters in the first part, which kind of sets up and frames um, some of the forced migration pieces. And then Professor Wilson chapter was on the issue of smuggling. So I'm going to turn it over now to Professor Burgess, who is the second one to talk about mixed migration. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, this, this, this volume was an adventure. <laughs> and my chapter is entitled Negotiating Ambiguous Status, Mixed Migration in Theory and Practice. And initially, Karen had this idea, and I signed on to it, to have a whole section on mixed migration. And as we went through this very long sort of painful process of collecting the authors and having them write their, their <coughs> chapters, we, we realized that there's not enough there there when it comes to mixed migration to really justify a whole section. So the best chapters in that section have been were then redistributed throughout the volume. Professor Wilson was one of the contributors originally to the mixed migration section. However, thankfully, she agreed that my chapter was worth keeping. Um, and I think there's certainly a chapter worth of material on mixed migration. So I'll just kind of talk through what I what I cover in the chapter. And the first question, which which Professor Wolf actually asked when we were chatting before this session, is what is mixed migration? Good question. Um, and to to paraphrase Nick Van Heer, who's one of the people who've written, who've written most about this, it's an intermingling of motives, pathways, strategies, and legal statuses of people on the move 
that challenges the artificial, what many of us would argue is the artificial distinction between forced and voluntary migration, right? And this is why there's this intersection between mixed migration and, and ambiguous status is because they're you know, sort of existing in the interstices of, of legal categories and sometimes they qualify and sometimes they don't. And so I'll talk a little bit more about what that, what that, that entails. Um, one of the ways that I kind of explain this in the, in the chapter is, is, is mixed migration exists at the murky edge of laws, policies, categories, and communities where the status of migrants and refugees is ambiguous and often fluid. Um, and so the chapter is kind of about what that means, what it looks like. Um, and I first engage in, in sort of a, a discussion of why is why has mixed migra migration become more relevant? Because I would argue that it has become more relevant. Um, and later on, I'll mention how it's entered into the policy discussion. And then actually, it's kind of been gone away a little bit. Um, but it was very much a part of the policy discussion for a while. So why has it become more relevant? Um, I argue that part of the reason is is the, the the hardening and expansion of border control, which has increased the costs of falling outside clearly defined legal categories. Um, and in for for decades, centuries, really, people without a clear sort of legal status would migrate and move. Um, sometimes in circular ways. Um, I, my work is on, mostly in the Americas and most more recently on the US-Mexico border. It was not that difficult for people to go back and forth. They didn't sort of fit into some protected category, um, but the costs of that were much lower than they are today. So that's one reason I think mixed migration has become more relevant and more has achieved, um, been given more attention. Another reason, and this is particularly true, but not exclusively true in the Americas, is there's been a diversification of the drivers as displacement. It's not pr primarily, I would even argue, conflict like war and persecution by the state, right? Now there are all these non-state actors that are producing conditions of violence that are displacing people. Um, uh, and, and, and yet our legal categories don't incorporate those kinds of displaced people very well. So it's another reason why mixed migration has become sort of more, more relevant in the current context. Um, and then, and what happens is that migrants and refugees, um, even those who on the face of it should fit, right, get caught in a kind of zigzag of stops and starts and detours and force returns. Um, and so migration is an even less linear process than maybe it, I mean, maybe it never was all that linear, but it's become even less linear. Um, than, than, than arguably it was even in a few decades ago. And this has a big impact on a widening array of communities, right? So, so this issue has now become really salient in places where it never was, right? Um, particularly transit communities, but often those transit communities get converted into places of settlement in part because of this, these broader changes in, in the overall landscape. So that I also have a section on how has mixed migration been kind of governed by global institutions. And the two institutions that are most relevant, not surprisingly, arguably are the UNHCR and IOM. And they've each defined mixed migrations differently, or they've, they've selected a partial definition that I would argue kind of serves their interests and agenda. So for the UNHCR, they focus on the mixed flows because they want to preserve the category of refugee but they recognize that refugees and others often travel along the same pathways, face the same challenges, um, you know, get kind of uh, uh, hire the same smugglers. So their con conceptualization of mixtization is it's a mix of flows, different types of people. IOM leaned in on the mixed motives um, understanding of mixed migration. So people leave for multiple motives. So those who traditionally might have been seen as leaving because of poverty are also fleeing gang violence and gender abuse and all sorts of things. Um, so that was sort of their preferred definition of mixed migration. I argue that neither is sufficient and in fact has perhaps led to some marginal adjustments in policies and protection, but the, those marginal adjustments have been overwhelmed by these, these larger forces, particularly toward greater securitization of borders. Um, and then even that movement toward a discussion of mixed migration, there's been, I think, a backtracking um, and I think that's best represented by the two global compacts, which kind of bring, 
there was an attempt to have a more holistic, inclusive approach through the discussion over the global context. But at the end of the day, for all sorts of reasons, you end up with one global contact, co compact for refugees and another global compact for migration, basically everybody else. Right. So we're sort of back you know, way back where we started initially. Um, and then finally, what I do in the in the in the chapter, which I won't go into detail about, but I I, I ask, well, how has mixed migration manifested at the U.S.-Mexico border, which where I had started working on, which my documentary is based for any of you who haven't seen it. Um, and I think it's it's a it's a really <clears throat> interesting microcosmic of all these microcosm of all these di dynamics that I've been talking about. I mean, one thing, there's been this great diversification of flows and motives of people arriving at the US-Mexico border. Um, and the response by the US government has been to essentially try to slow down or stop those seeking asylum, because asylum has become the sort of the new way to try to gain protected status in the United States. There are all sorts of other ways, um, but it put a lot of pressure on a system that wasn't set up to handle so many people. And the, many of these people have been displaced, but they don't actually fit the definition of a refugee or asylum seeker. And many of them will not eventually get asylum but it's a way to get protection, at least in the short to medium term. And so I talk about three different policies, metering system, remain in Mexico and Title 42. Don't have t time to, to, to go into detail about what those policies entailed. They were eventually terminated under the Biden administration. But if you've been paying attention, all three of them are now included in proposed executive orders, proposed legislation. So they're they are all they, all three of them have in, in some version. I think it's quite likely that they may be re re implemented. Um, and one of the things that they do is they is they keep they they lead to migrants and asylum seekers getting stuck on the Mexican side of the U.S. Mexico border, and then this further places pressure on local communities, okay. et cetera. Okay, um, so we can have a chance for change. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so my chapter basically maps out migration-related terminology. Many of the terms are legal categories, although not all of them. It's a fairly complex undertaking because there is inconsistent usage in practice. And if we're just looking at legal terminology, you have the the universal level, UN level legal terminology, which can be different from regional instruments, some regional treaties on refugees, for example, or on human trafficking or on torture, can use different definitions and different terminology. And then, of course, domestic law can also use different terminology and have different legal standards. The US, for example, the use of the term refugee in the US legally doesn't correspond exactly to the international law use of the term refugee. So that can sometimes cause confusion. For example, when you see in the news that the U.S. government has uh, raised or lowered the refugee cap, that's not a cap on the number of refugees that the U.S. will uh, allow to remain in the United States with some durable status. It's referring only to those who've been resettled from overseas, who've been determined to be refugees outside the United States. It wouldn't include refugees who entered the United States and then asked for asylum. So that always causes some confusion with U.S. partners when they think the U.S. is capping the total number, total number of refugees who can enter the United States and enjoy some durable right to remain. So you have that uh, level of complexity with this multi-level regulation of the terminology. And also there's a tendency to oversimplify. Uh, one of the great oversimplifications is the tendency to create a, a binary or a dichotomy between refugees and migrants. And people, and these are seen as mutually exclusive. If you're a migrant, you're not a refugee and vice versa. And this is unfortunate because it greatly oversimplifies the legal reality and also the empirical reality that Katrina was talking about, that there's a huge range of motivations and there are always both push factors and pull factors in any movement. There can be varying degrees of one or the other, but this creation of a binary doesn't correspond to reality. And it also leads 
state actors and other relevant actors to try and separate people into two groups, one humanitarian and the other not humanitarian. This is exemplified by a statement by a delegate at the stock taking conference in the lead up to the adoption of the Global Compact on Migration. This was in Mexico. I was with the Mexican delegation, so I was present when he said this. and. It's been uh, translated, the original was in, in the person's uh, first language. The quote is, it's important not to confuse the economic and humanitarian issues. What we're witnessing now is many people mixing migration issues and refugee issues. If we have to make sure, sorry, we have to make sure that these two are very clearly distinguished because these are two different areas covered by different areas of the law, one by economic law and the other by the rights of refugees. So this is sort of a classic creation of a classic binary that doesn't exist in reality. Because there are lots of different legal categories that individual migrants might qualify for or protections. And indeed, all migrants, whether they're refugees or not, benefit from international human rights law. And one of the points made in the chapter is the protections under human rights law for migrants have expanded, getting to the point where the distinction as to whether a, refugee, uh, a migrant is a refugee or not is becoming less relevant because the rights that migrants have under human rights law are quickly approaching the rights that migrants have if they also qualify as a refugee. In addition to that, there are lots of assumptions that people make, for example, about refugees. It's commonly assumed that they have a right of entry, which under the Refugee Convention, they do not. So refugees and migrants in that sense, sorry, I should say, refugees and other migrants um, are similarly situated in that neither actually has a right to enter. Refugees, if they enter regularly in accordance with domestic law, have a protection against expulsion. But so do migrants under international human rights law. If they enter irregularly, they're not protected against expulsion, either under refugee law or under human rights law. The one unique, what was previously a unique feature under refugee law is that refugees benefited from non refoulement If they entered irregularly, in violation of domestic law, they can be expelled, but they cannot be refooled back to the particular place where they were persecuted, but they can be expelled to a third country. Well, human rights law has developed to mirror that protection of non refoulement for everyone. So for any migrant, whether refugee or not, if they would face severe human rights violations, if sent to a particular country, there's an obligation not to refool them there under human rights law. And this applies to everyone, not just to refugees. The point being that the distinction between these categories is rapidly diminishing. Now, of course, there are interests in maintaining this perception and you know one of the agencies that perpetuates this binary is UNHCR they're getting a little more nuanced but of course they have skin in the game their funding depends on the existence of refugees with special needs that are different from others and so that's something you have to take into consideration when you're examining as, as we heard before the outputs of various different organizations that they may have particular interests that are causing them to formulate things in a certain way so ultimately my hope is that pro by providing a lexicon and saying well these are the definitions in international law and these are the most common usages it will help lead to a more consistent use of terminology so that conversations can be more productive. So people are actually talking about the same things. That's it. Thanks, John. That's really, that's really good. Okay, over to Professor Wilson. I need to read your chapter, but it's too expensive. So I see a piece of paper there. <laughs> um, so I, I want to um, talk about a couple of things. One is this chapter, but also a book I'm currently writing, two books actually, would not be possible without the Fletcher student body. Um, so in the since 2016, my dear friend and colleague Karen Jacobson convinced me back then that I should not just focus on financial inclusion, but could I bring some of those ideas and concepts to the world of migration? And I thought, oh, okay, great. Um, so how am I going to do this? So I was able to score two plane tickets to Greece with um, uh, now Dr. Roxane Cristalli. And we went to Athens and collectively um, started poking around. And we found that by and large, many of the refugees there were not Syrian. They were from Afghanistan. They were from Iran. 
They were from um, e different parts of East Africa, different parts of West Africa. So some Fletcher students dropped everything um, and came over. Those that international students that had native, native level um, linguistic skills in the mother tongues of the refugees themselves and were able to elicit so much high quality information. So how we did it is they would, they would translate for me for, for the first day or two, and then they saw how I was approaching the questions and the people. And then I would just be available to them as they would interview people in their own language. And we repeated this in Costa Rica. I like to go to nice places, by the way. <laughs> um, and um, again, I brought uh, Nepali speaking students, Bangla speaking students, um, uh, Hindi speaking students, uh, um, Arabic, French, and of course Spanish. And so there were eight Fletcher people, and um, again, we did the same thing, and they were able to elicit so much high quality information. Um, so I, I want to kind of thank you uh, in a pay it forward or pay it backwards sort of way. Um, and, and I've continued doing this here, actually. Uh, uh, Professor Wolf has helped me out through the Hitachi Center, and we, we, are, we talk to migrants and refugees right here in this area, um, again, using the native level language skills of the students themselves. Um, so what did we find? I was focusing on how smuggling is financed along certain routes, right? We couldn't get every route, the world is big, um, but along four or five different routes, how does smuggling get financed? And it turns out if you're going from Afghanistan to Greece, you are using the same systems that were used on the Silk Road that the Prophet Muhammad used, that Marco Polo used, um, if in fact he did travel the Silk Route the way he claimed, there's, that's up for grabs. Um, th these are ancient systems and they're extremely clever. Um, and you can find the same systems in the Knights Templar when they were moving people around for the Crusades. Um, they're all the same systems and they revolve on sending codes, sending messages, um, letting people know where you are along the waypoint. So for example, if it costs you $15,000 to move one person from, from Kabul to Athens, how you pay for that really matters. It matters to your safety. Um, so if you're gonna pay it all up front, you're vulnerable to the smuggler, right? If you're going, most smugglers won't let you pay it at, at the end, but some do. But then you're still vulnerable because if you can't come up with that money at the end of your journey, you're going to be beaten to a fairly well. Um, so your safety matters. What you want is to pay along the different waypoints. Um, and this is exactly what we found. Now that, that particular system is not used by Nepalis traveling, let's say, to the United States via South America. They're using a different system that involves banks, but still there's, there's um, different ways of determining safety. So we found out these journeys are very expensive. Just to give you an example, to, to move from Kathmandu um, to, uh, let's say, as far as Costa Rica, you're, you can plan on spending $41,000. How does that get financed, right? We're talking about the poorest districts of Nepal. Well, it turns out that getting people to the United States is money lenders love this because it's a high return on investment. And they, there's one quote in, um, in this chapter about how the, uh, if, if you wanna build a hotel here, no one will fund you. If you wanna buy a taxi, no one will fund you. If you want to help smuggle, if you want to be smuggled to the United States, I can get people lining up behind you to fund you. So it, again, it depends on the route. That's not necessarily the same from Cameroon to let's say the United States. Um, so anyway, thanks to the students, we were able to get this information. And just as importantly as eliciting the information in the mother tongue was being able to go back to the hotel at night and having them search local journals, for, again, in Nepali or Bangla to find out Okay, what's going on? Now that I know the terminology, how can I verify this information? Um, so that was really important. The last thing I want to say is um, very happily, I had a co-author in this. And at first, um, I think it was you, yeah. And Katrina said, there's a, a really wonderful anthropologist, Luigi Achille, and um, you're gonna love him. And I thought, no, I'm not. <laughs> it's a forced marriage. Well, I think he is spectacular. Um, we had a few, we had a few calls on on Zoom, and philosophically, we were just completely um, one and the same, totally parallel. 
And um, it was an absolute pleasure. And if you do get a chance to read this very expensive chapter, um, <laughs> do focus on some of his stories because he talks about um, the in and outness of clandestinity, the back and forth. You're a refugee one day, but you're, you're a smuggler the next because you need to work your way along the route. You might be returning part way and coming back to bring people because you can get a discount that way to smugglers. Anyway, he's a very skilled anthropologist and it was a delight to meet him. Great, well, thank you so much, everybody. We, we do have some time for q and I just wanna say one more thing about the book, which is that one of the things that's different, another of the many things that's different about this book is that we, we wanted to get not just, we wanted to get the voices of both of, of, of forced migrants in there and of practitioners. So what we did is we, of course, have a large network of people we know who are forced migrants, migrants and we asked them, the editor, Maxim and I, to write little little essays so that there's a piece in the a section called the lived experience so so i don't know six or seven people wrote about their experience and then we also wanted to get the practitioner experience so we asked again we have a large network there we asked our friends <laughs> basically who are retired we want to get people who are no longer in the un system and basically and only we asked people who had worked in senior positions in unhcr and in <laughs> iom to write about what they thought was a problem, what, how they, they thought the organizations were changing, what were the problems, where should they go, and so forth. So we had some senior people, heads of, of country reps and so forth, who were writing quite uh, interesting little essays in, in this book. And just to last to say that basically the book is a critique. So there's a really uh, critical perspective that we bring to bear, both on things like you know, governments and, and UN agencies and NGOs, but also on the, on some of the conceptual pieces in, in forced migration, like these narratives, like, like how we think about it, the philosophical and historical underpinnings and so forth. So I encourage you to read it, even though we keep hammering, and Ellen's very annoyed with us, but we keep hammering how expensive the book is. The library has three, three copies. Well, we have a, an electronic copy, so you yeah. can, yeah, I'll dip in. Can, can we print from the digital? Yes, you can download chapters. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions? Do people want to ask anything? Yeah. Please. I'm excited about this book. I might not afford it. But, um, I think it's an interesting subject. Um, and I like the fact that you are open to three people. Sometimes we sit back and just writing what we think. Um, I think there's a pro poem which uh, says, it says, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. So, <laughs> so there's, there's that poem. And, and, and my thinking is that we have a lot of knowledge, a lot of information, but the thing we need to be keeping asking ourselves is how do we address this problem? I'm actually doing a capstone on uh, local integration of refugees because I think human beings deserve solutions for the reasons why they are, they are moving out. Everyone is moving out in the hope of a better life. I don't think there's any other thing that drives people to, to, to move out. So I think I like this particular subject but again i hope there's something that says okay how do we address this particular problem it's hard to come by statistics sometimes getting unhcr to provide you certain statistics is also not easy so i don't know whether you are able to get this information whether you can provide linkages because we need to talk about this particular issue and provide a solution to uh, the refugee problem I come from Kenya, where refugees have been for over three decades. So I know of children who have been born there, educated there, and it's like their life has come to a stop. Thanks for that. Yeah, actually, UNHCR is one of the few agencies that does have regular statistics that they put out, regular data that are fairly organized and are increasingly um, 
fulsome. I mean, you can find out a lot. Of course, it's just about registered refugees, which are a subset of all the, the people who are forced migrants in the world, but it's something, and it's comparable across countries. So it is a, I use those, those data a lot. They come out every June, and they're, they're pretty useful. So. Can I weigh in? Yeah. Uh, I think there's a lot of space between the mouth of the shark and searching for a better life. Right. I think the mouth of the shark cases are actually a much smaller percentage in the sense that the overwhelming majority of people on the move are not an imminent threat to their lives. But for sure, they're in search of a better life, almost invariably. And there's a, there's a huge range in between those two things. And part of what we're seeing going on around the world is some governments trying to smoke out the push factors and the pull factors. So for example, the UK's Rwanda plan, the Australia offshoring, the idea is if you're motivated by a push factor, by the mouth of the shark, you'll be happy to be settled in Rwanda. The idea is if you enter the UK irregularly and, st and you apply for asylum, instead of being settled in the UK, you're settled in Rwanda. And so the notion is, if you're really someone who's in the mouth of the shark back home, you'll be happy to be in Rwanda where you're not in the mouth of the shark. Your life may not be better, but you won't be in the mouth of the shark. That's to say, well, is, what's going on here? Is it the pull factor of wanting to be in the UK or the push factor of fleeing the situation in Afghanistan? Which is it and to what degree? And so I think that's a, an, an yeah. interesting development. And I'm work, I think we're going to see more yeah. of that in this quest to, to sort of disaggregate this push factor from this pull factor. Yeah, and I would say that that also leads, feeds into the narrative that I was talking about in the beginning. That, that many governments have that, and part of that narrative is there are good, deserving refugees. The good ones are the ones who will give asylum to and will help and will give them assistance and all that good stuff. The, the deserving ones. But the, the other ones, those are the ones that we're not going to. So that, that's part of this narrative that's being pushed is if you're truly deserving, then you can come and then we'll help you. But if you aren't, so that fits into this. this yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm Siranus. Um, I'm refugee uh, from Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, and saying refugee, I'm actually, I'm not sure if I am refugee or not, because I'm forcibly displaced. But I don't know even who giving this uh, you know, status of refugee, if, it's, if it should do Armenian government or, I don't know, UN or. So, and I have a lot of these questions and struggles when I um, covering the stories of refugees uh, uh, with these terminologies, but also I have a lot of questions like how to show their lives. This is not only because my life, my family life, but also when you said like, you know, uh, it, it's very struggling. Like I don't want to show them um, like, miserable i don't know like so but also how to because my goal is not just you know write a story but help them uh, especially because nagorno karabakh is small uh, and a lot of people know each other even so for example when i um, post an article or photos on social media and some people get help and mostly they get help so for me, it's more, you know, I feel better than, uh, I don't know, thousand people read my article. So, but how to do that, like not harm them, um, but show the reality. And also I have a lot of questions, like what kind of help they, um, they should receive and uh, assistance and how it's, uh, who is managing, who is, who is deciding, like, for example, refugee from Kenya, from other, should receive this kind of help and refugees from Nagorno? Because I can, like, from my uh, example, I can say, like, um, during these six months, um, or it's already six months, uh, I receive uh, $500 whole these six months. And as you can understand, it's not enough for refugee, and especially during these days uh, uh, in Armenia, it's very cold. And how these families, like, um, 
you know, struck, I, I'm privileged. Like I'm here, I can study and even this month be a little bit far from this hardship. But, it, you know, there are a lot of questions which I, I don't have answer and um, I hope I can somehow um, get your book and read and maybe I will receive uh, uh, several answers at least. Thank you for your book. Can I quickly respond? Yeah. So whether one is a refugee or not doesn't depend on an outside determination. It's just whether a question of the facts of your situation fulfill the legal requirements of the definition in the Refugee Convention. And then wherever that person finds themselves, if they're a refugee, that state, if they're a party to the Refugee Convention and Protocol, have obligations under the convention toward that person. Um, and those generally are obligations to treat the refugee as well as that state treats its own nationals. Basically, it's acting as a surrogate nationality for that person, that, that government of that state is exercising international protection over the person in the way that that person's country of nationality is supposed to. It's to, to, to sort of replace that relationship between individual and state of nationality. The global average for actual protection offered is not a very good one, to be sure. So this term international protection doesn't necessarily have a whole lot of content other than that person gets to be treated the same way as the other citizens of the state in which they find themselves. Yeah, because with, well, like with all laws, international laws, it's only as good as the, the government itself, the host government, is good, implements those laws. Well, even if it signs on to the convention, and Kenya is a very good example of this, um, they sign on to the convention but have handed over all responsibility to refugees, or I had until recently, to UNHCR. And so UNHCR is basically the, the organization that, that manages in the camps the, the, the Kenya. But of course, as we know in Kenya, and certainly in Armenia, um, most of, the people, most of the people who are forced migrants in these countries, even though they have camps, are not in the camps. And I don't have to tell you about Nairobi <laughs> and Eastleigh, which is basically full of refugees. And there's a bus running regularly between Kakuma and Nairobi between Dada. Similarly, I mean, it's very much about what the government does with that law, whether it signs the convention or not. It's how they treat them. Most of the Middle Eastern countries have not signed the convention, but they still give refugees a lot of assistance because they've handed it basically <coughs> over to the HCR. Egypt has signed the convention. It does nothing to all for refugees. It hands everything over to, to um, UNHCR. So, you know, it's very much about what, what the country, the host state, the host government decides to do about refugees, if anything, and UNHCR can come and take over a lot of those responsibilities. So, yeah, I mean, an engine. A question. Um, when you talk about deserving refugees and sort of the framing that goes into talking about these populations. In the last couple of weeks, I've seen more and more discussion of the Chinese um, migration up through the southern border, and I thought, oh, that's politics. I think they're, they're talking to our presidential um, you know, discussion. And, but in fact, it turns out that the data shows this is the number one demographic. And I'm, I'm trying to understand, is that political repression from what are they? Are they escaping something, or are they moving towards a better economic life? Uh, there's a, all of you that are interested in this, um, Al Jazeera it just put out part one of a two-part series mm -hmm. on exactly that. Oh, okay. Um, the, the people coming from mainland China, sometimes through Hong Kong, to Ecuador, and then working their way up here. And so part two, I think, is more about what happens when they are here, but it gives some of the political background. It's, and it, it's also very human. It's actually a really nice segment. So, I'm interested. Yeah, well, I've and also for free. Heard, uh, like a national security frame put around those. Yeah, I know. It depends on the audience. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, so, for students that are interested in migration and considering working for, let's say, like IOM, UNHCR, even the federal government, State Department, things like that. Like, how do we go about our work without, like, perpetuating Good this, like, distinguishing question. of 
migrants for working on like the global compact for refugees, like in doing that, am I furthering this distinction? No, no, so I don't know, like, what okay, any let me, this is, let me give you a perfect, we were just in DC, all, all three of us, um, mm -hmm. and met with the State Department, with PRM, the State Department, the State Department in the US is, is handles and funds, is the main funder for UNHCR. So basically the US government funds way more refugee programs and refugee assistance and all the rest than any other. Nobody comes even close, even the EU. So the P PRM is really the place you would go, right? The, the, the Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration in the state. Now, we, Fletcher, has a, have a phenomenal number of students, alums, in the State Department and in UNHCR. I'll give you a little story. Years ago, I was working in, UN, in, the, in UNHCR in Geneva. I was on leave of absence from Tufts. And um, one day I was, I, was, I was standing in the corridor and I, someone I knew I bumped into and she and I were talking, standing, and then someone walked past and said, wait, did I hear the word Fletcher? And the next thing he said, oh, ah, ah. and then, then I found out that at that time there were dozens, just hundreds of students, Fletcher students working in UNHCR, to the point where students who were in one of my forced migration courses from like 2012 or something, there were so many of them in Geneva that they all got to, and they all get, were getting together, they took me out for dinner. One class from 2000, <laughs> there is so many. So the, there's a long story to telling you that what you need to do is to connect with the Fletcher Alum Network because there are so many of them in this field, in, both in the UN, not just UNHCR, in IOM, UNICEF, you name it, and also in the State Department and in senior positions now. I mean, the person that we met there last week, Kate Papaki, had, what is now runs the admissions budget, the US RAP, the US Refugee Admissions Program, which is all resettlement people. She runs their budget. That's a budget just for resettlement of $1.5 billion. And so, so Kate is, is um, like an amazing person. She's very much very close, very involved. So anyway, the answer to your question is get in there, yes. And then be aware, as Kate is, Kate is one of the biggest critics mm -hmm. of, of, of PRM's um, you know, their policy and their discussions. She gets up and says, but what about humanitarian law? What about, you know, neutrality? And what about all of these things? And she, and she pushes them from inside. That is the best place to be, is to be in the organization and to be, you know, pushing and, and, and stirring it up from inside. You know, it's one thing for academics and critics to sit outside and, you know, copying at them all the time. It's quite another to have people inside really um, stirring and pushing and being the force for change. So please go into the UN and please go into state and, or, or, or uh, USAID, which is what handles ID internally displaced people and state handles um, refugees. So, yeah, I encourage you all and I'm very much keen to help you get there. <laughs> so I think we're at the end of I think we one more question. Anybody have a burning question? No? Well help yourself to some so snacks. This was fabulous. We're all gonna dip in online to parts of this book. <laughs> Adam will be editing us <laughs> 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 <laughs>